Hey everyone, this is Kyle Welch with RCR Wireless News. Again, I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, Spectrum Clearing, Preparing for Future Services, presented by Rody and Schwartz. Our presenter today is Paul Denisowski, Applications Engineer at Rody and Schwartz. At this time, I'd like to pass the presentation over to Paul. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome again to our webinar, Spectrum Clearing, Preparing for Future Services. My name is Paul Denisowski, and I'm an applications engineer at Rodian Schwartz, where I specialize in, among other things, interference hunting and mobile network testing. Now, we've done a, quite a few webinars on the topic of interference hunting and mobile network testing, and some of the questions that have been coming up more and more frequently in the last year or two have to do with spectrum reallocations. That is, either converting spectrum from 2G or 3G use for use in LTE, or the reallocation of spectrum from services such as over-the-air television or military use frequencies into spectrum that will almost certainly be used for LTE or someday maybe 5G. Today's webinar, therefore, deals with the topic of spectrum clearing. In other words, how do we make sure that this reallocated or reassigned spectrum um, is free from undesired signals before we start deploying these new services in them? As with all of our webinars, this webinar is designed to provide practical advice on spectrum clearing, building on many of the lessons that we learned during the clearing of 700 megahertz here in the United States, which was, of course, the first step in the initial deployments of LTE. So without further ado, let's begin. The first thing we're going to do is to give a short overview of spectrum and spectrum allocation, or better said, spectrum reallocation. This is a somewhat complicated regulatory topic, and unfortunately, it's also very country or region specific. The process is different in different countries and in different parts of the world, so we're going to handle that topic in a fairly generic, non-US centric way, well, as much as possible in this case. We'll then go on to give an overview of the spectrum clearing process itself, how to do it, um, followed by more detailed descriptions of the different tools, methodologies, techniques that are used in spectrum clearing. Again, with a focus on practical, useful examples. We'll close with a summary of some of the lessons that we learned during the clearing of 700 megahertz LTE in the United States. As many of you, I'm, I'm sure, remember, 700 megahertz was a bit of, well, disaster is probably a strong word. But it was not exactly the cleanest spectrum after it was allegedly vacated by its former occupants. And so I think there's a lot of value in looking back at the issues and solutions we came up with back then, uh, especially because many of these are almost certainly going to apply in clearing 600 megahertz as well. And lastly, time permitting, we'll have a live Q&A. So if you have any questions or feedback, uh, please submit those at any time during the webinar. Uh, anybody who hasn't spent the last 20 years living in a cave, which incidentally has really poor propagation, but you know that there's been a huge explosion in terms of the number of wireless devices. Uh, I think the latest numbers show that there are more cell phones than people in most advanced countries. And of course, these devices need spectrum to operate in. That said, I should also point out that there are plenty of other spectrum users other than mobile or cellular network operators. They're broadcasters, two-way services, military and government users, uh, radar, satellite, etc. And all of these are competing for spectrum. Unlike something like fiber optics, where you can simply lay more fiber when you need more capacity, spectrum is a finite resource. You can't lay more spectrum. Our old friends Shannon and Hartley showed that there's a finite limit to, to bits per hertz. So no matter what kind of signal-to-noise ratio you may be able to obtain, at some point, you're going to need more spectrum if you want to improve performance. Uh, this is certainly the case with LTE and more recent flavors of Wi-Fi, where wider bandwidths are better. And from a practical perspective, it helps to have contiguous blocks of spectrum, although there are ways, um, carrier aggregation and LTE is a good example, to work around this issue. It's interesting to note, too, that although LTE allows for channel bandwidths of up to 20 megahertz, initial LTE deployments in the United States only used bandwidths of less than or equal to 10 megahertz, um, simply because there wasn't enough, let's call it practically parable spectrum for 20 megahertz channels. Now, it is true that there are substantial, very wide chunks of more or less open spectrum, but part of the problem here is that the usefulness of spectrum is very much a function of frequency. The example I like to use is FM radio. 100 megahertz is a great frequency for broadcasting over relatively large distances with good in-building penetration. But the idea of an FM broadcaster at, say, 5 gigahertz is, is completely absurd. In cellular radio networks, we generally want to use frequencies that have a decent range, a few kilometers at least, and relatively good in-building penetration, 
So that limits the frequencies that are practical for use in cellular networks. Now that's not to say that very high frequencies are always bad. We, we certainly don't want Wi-Fi access points being visible across town. We don't want automotive radar bouncing off cars 10 miles ahead of us on the interstate, etc. And for in-building applications, very high frequencies might be just the thing we need. Because these higher frequencies don't propagate far or penetrate well, there's less need to regulate who gets to use them. And this is why you find more unlicensed spectrum the higher you go in frequency. But in order to avoid interference at lower frequencies, someone has to decide who gets to use the spectrum. That is, the spectrum has to be allocated. Most countries, and I'm going to say most countries simply because I, I don't have an exhaustive list, but most countries have some sort of governmental regulatory authority that allocates spectrum to a specific user or a group of users. In the United States, this is our good friend, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. And in the UK, it's Ofcom, etc. These regulatory authorities essentially decide who gets to use what frequencies and for what services. And this permission is typically awarded in the form of a license. And again, being a finite and valuable resource, these licenses often come at a very substantial cost. The problem is that um, all of the useful spectrum in most countries is already allocated to someone. I felt compelled to include a small image of the famous United States frequency allocation chart on this slide. It doesn't really matter that you can't read anything on it here because even when it's blown up to poster size, it's still so crowded that it's almost impossible to read anything on it. Um, but in any case, this does point out the fact that most spectrum is already being used by someone else. And if we want to in introduce new services or expand existing services, we have to shuffle things around. We have to reallocate the spectrum. And again, since all the good spectrum is already being used in most places, new services or expanded services can only be deployed if someone has moved out of the spectrum that they're using. This process is unsurprisingly called spectrum reallocation or more commonly spectrum refarming. Uh, some people call it spectrum repurposing. Now, there really are two different ways that this can occur. One way is to move some existing service out of the spectrum that it used to occupy, or in some cases simply turn off the old service. Uh, the best known example of this in the United States is the reallocation of 700 megahertz from over-the-air UHF TV stations to cellular, more specifically to LTE service. Uh, we'll see more of this in detail on the next slide. The important thing here is that not only does the type of service, TV versus cellular, change, but the owner, or, or licensee really, of the spectrum also changes. Now the second type of spectrum reallocation uh, in this type, the spectrum doesn't actually change hands. The owner or the licensee stays the same, but the spectrum is put to different use. For example, a mobile network operator may take the spectrum that they were previously using for another service, say GSM, WCDMA, et cetera, even something like IDEN, and use that spectrum for LTE instead. And in fact, this is becoming increasingly popular as mobile network operators try to move away from legacy technologies and move towards an all LTE network. Um, although this would seem to be a relatively simple and risk-free operation, as we'll see, that's not always the case. One last note uh, before we move on. We've been talking about spectrum allocations and spectrum refarming as if every chunk of spectrum was allocated to one and only one service. While this is often the case, it's certainly not universally so. Um, there's some reason, regions of spectrum that have both primary and secondary users, with the secondary user agreeing not to cause quote-unquote harmful interference to the primary user. So it's best not to automatically assume that a new spectrum allocation is yours and yours alone. Uh, a good example of this is the coexistence, again in quotation marks, of S-band radar and LTE at 3.5 gigahertz. Um, this has not always been as harmonious as one might have hoped. But for the time being, let's look at a relatively straightforward example of spectrum allocation from the United States. Uh, in this case, we're looking at over-the-air television. Anyone growing up prior to the 1980s probably remembers that UHF dial on their television set with a huge range of channels printed on that dial. And you might also remember that almost none of those channels were actually being used. When AMPS, the, the original 1G cellular in the United States, was first being deployed, the FCC reallocated some of the upper UHF TV channels to use this for use with this emerging service. Uh, in fact, you could theoretically, uh, listen in to analog cellular phone conversations using a very old UHF TV. In any case, as time went on, the FCC further reduced the number of UHF TV channels, reallocating the spectrum as other cellular technologies, like GSM, were deployed and spread. And the most recent example of this is, of course, the allocation of 700 megahertz to LTE, 
something that was done at approximately the same time as the DTV, the digital TV transition. Because of the importance of cellular services and the general decline, or at least lower levels of use, of UHF television, the FCC is planning to auction off another, it's about 120 megahertz of spectrum at 600 megahertz. Uh, and this is spectrum that's currently occupied by UHF television channels. The details and exact procedure by which this will be done keeps changing, but it's a pretty safe bet that it will happen someday. You know, it's always maybe next year. And again, just as was the case with 600 mega, 700 megahertz, this new spectrum at 600 megahertz will need to be cleared before it can be used by the new licensees. So let's talk about spectrum clearing. It may or may not come as a surprise to you that simply winning the auction and being awarded the license does not automatically provide spectrum that is clear and ready to use. Generally speaking, licensed broadcasters or other licensed users of spectrum will have been participants in this whole spectrum reallocation process, and therefore they'll be aware of their responsibility to vacate spectrum by a certain date. Unfortunately, in addition to the odd licensed user who didn't get the memo, so to speak, uh, there are usually a non-trivial number of other RF sources in that previously licensed spectrum, some of which may have been issued to previous occupants and some of which may have gone unnoticed. The important point here is that one should never assume that spectrum has been cleared simply by virtue of its being allocated to someone else. The spectrum needs to be checked to see if it's clear and any remaining issues must be identified, located, resolved, etc. before deploying the new service. Again, this is a lesson that was learned, sometimes painfully, during the uh, 700 megahertz LTE deployment. So given that spectrum must be cleared after being reallocated, who's responsible for this spectrum clearing? Just as there are different regulatory agencies and spectrum allocations and rules slash responsibilities in every different country, the responsibility for spectrum clearing also varies by country. In an ideal world, licensees would receive spectrum that's pre-inspected, it's pristine, all possible sources of interference removed, and so I've been told anyway, this does happen in certain countries. Here in the United States, however, the situation is somewhat different. Although the FCC does hold the authority to allocate spectrum and regulate its use, we can also find people who violate these rules, the FCC does not proactively drive around clearing recently reallocated spectrum. What this means on a practical level is that it's normally the spectrum licensee who's responsible for detecting and locating unwanted signals in their new spectrum, with the FCC typically only getting involved if there's a failure to resolve the issue without their help. The practical consequence of this is that if you happen to be the lucky winner of a spectrum auction, you will be largely responsible for making sure your spectrum is clean and for taking at least the initial steps anyway to fix things if the spectrum is not clean. Now, let's talk about spectrum interference, uh, I'm sorry, let's talk about spectrum clearing and interference hunting. Um, there's certainly a lot of similarities between interference hunting and spectrum clearing, but they're not really quite the same thing. Uh, first of all, the term interference implies that there's another service or signal that's being interfered with. And obviously this is not the case during the initial clearing of spectrum because there should be no services there. Similarly, not every signal detected within cleared spectrum will necessarily be an interferer. It's important to remember that what makes something interferer is not the level of the interferer measured at the interferer itself, but rather the level measured at the affected device, the victim, usually the base station, right? Uh, for example, if I have a cable television leak that measures around, say, neg 50 dBm at the leak, most people would call that an interferer. I would. But is it really? If that leak were very near a base station, it probably would cause issues. But if it's 10 miles away from the nearest base station, it most likely is not an interfere, due primarily to the path loss between the leak and the station. Uh, this, again, may sound obvious, but it bears repeating. Something is an interferer based on both its level and its location. Why is this important for spectrum clearing? Well, it's difficult to say if something is a potential interferer until we know where the victim, or the interferee, will be located. And as we'll see in a few slides, this again becomes a bit of a chicken and the egg problem. Do we only look for unwanted signals near proposed base station locations? Do we only propose base station locations away from unwanted signals or some combination of both? Of course, the assumptions here are that we're clearing reallocated spectrum before any new services are turned on. 
And normally, of course, this is a correct assumption. The best time to do interference, uh, to do spectrum clearing rather, is before new services are turned on. It's much, much, much easier to find and measure unwanted signals and the ambient noise floor when there are no other signals around. The pair of screenshots uh, here show a fairly large interferer on the left that then becomes completely masked underneath a PDLTE signal when that service is turned on. I would say that anyone who's done any interference hunting knows how much easier their job would be if they could simply snap their fingers and turn off all the signals they're not interested in. And ideally, this is the environment we would have when we start doing spectrum clearing, again, before new services are turned on. So we said we should do spectrum clearing before new services are turned on, but how much before? In some cases, it can be advantageous to actually start looking at the spectrum before the old services are even turned off. One recurrent and important theme in spectrum clearing is that just because the spectrum was clean enough for the old services doesn't mean that it's clean enough for the new service. Many potential interferers existed at 700 megahertz long before it was reallocated to LTE, but they simply weren't bothering anyone. So no one went to look for them and no one was aware that they existed. Uh, likewise, knowing what signals are normally in a band that will be reallocated allows us to more easily recognize any stragglers, let's call them, that don't move or go off the air when the reallocation date rolls around. So what exactly then do we mean when we say that spectrum is clear? Well, one approach we could take is to define some maximum level above which signals become a problem. Some people would refer to this as defining the noise floor. For example, they would say the noise floor in this area should be less than neg 110 dBm. The question then becomes, what should this level be? We alluded at the beginning to the fact that some spectrum reallocation involved taking spectrum that was used for older cellular technologies, let's say GSM, and using them for newer cellular technologies like LTE. And this is actually fairly common. Uh, it's becoming more common over the last few years. What's equally common is the fact that in some cases, spectrum that had been used quote unquote interference free for many, many years was suddenly found to contain all kinds of interference. What really happened is there were always various types of interference in that spectrum, but they didn't bother the former occupants. Uh, sometimes this was because of the power levels involved. For example, cable TV egress can be quite loud at 700 megahertz. It's been there for a long time but it's rarely loud enough to interfere with an over-the-air UHF television broadcaster. Sometimes it, the issue is due to the nature of the signal modulation. As many of you know, GSM and IDEN, for example, are very robust modulation schemes compared to LTE. But to get the full benefit of the higher order modulation schemes in LTE, you need a much lower noise floor. So again, it's very important to define clear in terms of the new service that we'll be deploying, not the old one. Now that we've come up with a definition of clear in terms of a received power threshold, we need to start checking as to whether our spectrum is really clear or not, usually within a certain geographical area or market. In most cases, this area is large enough that it's not really practical to cover it on foot. So driving becomes the order of the day when we start doing spectrum clearing. And in the initial stages of spectrum clearing, most of the work is likely to be done behind a windshield. That's not to say that we can do spectrum clearing purely from vehicles, though. Um, it's true, generally speaking, that outdoor signals are higher power than indoor signals. Uh, there are, unfortunately, lots and lots of cases where issues are found only indoors, and the source of those issues is also indoors. A case in point would be, say, a basketball stadium, a concert hall, et cetera, where we find devices like wireless microphones, plasma displays, et cetera, that are still operating in spectrum that was supposed to be cleared. In this case, we will also have to do foot-based testing. That is, we, we actually have to walk around indoors. In-building systems and in-building coverage, as many of you already know, are becoming increasingly important. And in-building spectrum clearing is part of this evolution as well. Note too here that we want to make multiple runs. It's not really enough to drive or walk your geography once and go, it's clear. Uh, we need to check at both busy and off hours on different days, etc. Especially if we're looking for intermittent or time dependent sources. Spectrum clearing should ideally slowly morph into regular coverage testing and not be seen as a, a one shot, one off affair. The concept of path loss, by the way, is very important in spectrum clearing. Uh, we're gonna come back to that in a few more slides.
of course, detecting a signal above a certain threshold is uh, obviously the starting point for spectrum clearing. But where are these signals coming from? What are they? To complete the spectrum clearing process, we need to identify and locate the sources of these signals, something that's made much easier by knowing something about the source that we're looking for. Signals appearing in supposedly cleared spectrum generally fall into three categories. The first of these is what I'll call stragglers. Uh, these are the services or devices that were previously licensed to operate in spectrum, but which have, for whatever reason, not vacated the spectrum on time. These are also typically the easiest to find, since they tend to be things such as broadcasters or radio services with fixed sites, etc. Usually you can simply look them up by frequency or location using, say, the FCC geolocation database and give them a call and say, why are you still on the air? Slightly more difficult are devices that used to be legal, let's say, at a given frequency, but which no longer are. Wireless microphones are an excellent example from 700 megahertz. Most of the major sound equipment manufacturers or microphone manufacturers made wireless microphones at 700 megahertz. And users of these microphones didn't really register or license them as individuals to use them. And these devices were legal to use at these frequencies until, of course, the FCC reallocated the spectrum. Needless to say, many of the people using these microphones, uh, churches, schools, small venues, etc., were not aware of this change. Um, and there were a lot of microphones found in the early days of 700 megahertz LTE. If we're aware of uh, what these devices are, and we know, then we would also know what to look for after the switch is made. The last category here is the most challenging. Signals that really never should have been in that spectrum in the first place. They were never legal in that spectrum. These could be spurious emissions, harmonics, intermod products, etc. Uh, cable television is a great example of this because although it does operate at the same, intentionally operates at the same frequencies as over-the-air television, it's supposed to stay inside the cable, so to speak. Uh, here again, in all of these cases, this is where our skills and techniques that we learned in interference hunting and direction finding become very important. So let me return to our definition again of what clear means. Again, typically we're trying to ensure there are no signals above a certain level in our geographical area of interest, but measured from where? Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that what makes something an interferer is both its level and its location. That smoking hot cable leak is a big problem if it's hanging from a pole across the street from an e-node B. It's not so much of a problem when it's five miles away on the other side of, say, a big hill. Normally, we don't cover every square meter of our intended service area. We make measurements at certain distance intervals, and <laughs> conveniently, these intervals are usually chosen as roads. Right? We drive down two parallel roads and assume that we see anything between those two roads. But is this correct? Well, it depends. Obviously, signal strength decreases as a function of attenuation. And attenuation is a function of distance. How far away is it? And attenuation itself, um, that is what's between us and the signal, buildings, trees, etc. In a best case scenario, when there are no intervening objects, we can use a so-called path loss calculation to determine how far away we can see a source of a given amplitude. This in turn would give us our best, or worst, depending on how you look at it, case scenario as to how far apart our drive routes can be and still reliably detect any signals with a level of X. Let's look at an example. Say we're trying to clear some spectrum at 650 megahertz someday. And we want to detect all sources with a transmit power of at least neg 50 dBm, a fairly hefty source. If we're using an instrument capable of detecting signals down to neg 120 dBm, we're looking at a path loss of neg 120 minus neg 50 is 70 dBm. With a little math, or here a handy path loss smartphone app, we can see that a free space path loss of 70 dB at 650 megahertz translates into a distance of about 116 meters. This means that if we were driving in a field or a desert, we could be up to 116 meters away from the source and still see it. Now, clearly there are several things that need to be considered here. First, we also have to factor in any transmit and receive gains, particularly antenna gains, uh, gains from a preamp or an LNA if applicable. We also importantly have to take into account intervening objects. This is obviously a much bigger problem in say Manhattan versus Boise. But even having to account for these parameters, path loss calculations can help us make more efficient decisions in terms of drive routes and the probability of detecting signals in the spectrum that we're clearing. 
again, even if your market is very small, it's unlikely you're going to be doing your spectrum clearing on foot. Indeed, it's almost certain that the vast majority of your spectrum clearing will be done in a vehicle, as this is really the only practical way to cover a larger geography. Since we're going to be in a vehicle, it's important to make sure that we use a good non-directional external antenna. More on this later. Uh, Instrument-wise, there are a number of tools that can be used, coverage measurement or drive to test scanners, spectrum analyzers, etc. Again, we're going to go into a good deal more detail on these tools and techniques a little bit further on in the presentation. The biggest challenge is, of course, the optimization, optimization rather, of drive routes. Although the ideal scenario would be to drive down every street, this may or may not be practical in your area. So we need to choose routes that minimize driving time, but also maintain a certain, let's call it detection probability. This is where the path loss calculations are a good starting point. One other important note here, part of maximizing our driving efficiency is to um, choose routes that minimize driving time, but also maintain a certain detection probability. Um, we want to drive these routes or drive as few routes as possible and as quickly as possible, again, subject to local traffic laws. Um, some instruments, such as FFT-based monitoring receivers, may be more advantageous in the situation because their architecture gives them better speed and higher probability of intercept compared to, say, traditional spectrum analyzers. When it comes to indoor versus outdoor, there's certainly plenty of cases, plenty of cases, where outdoor signals penetrate indoors and indoor signals penetrate outdoors. But there are also plenty of situations where undesired signals are generated and stay completely within an indoor structure. In order to resolve these issues, a certain amount of spectrum clearing must be done on foot. It should be noted here too that uh, depending on your market or geography, foot-based spectrum clearing may in some cases be more efficient than driving, for example, if you're in a large city. Of course, there are limits here as well. It's neither necessary nor desirable to check all indoor locations. There is no need to go door to door in residential neighborhoods, etc. On the other hand, walking larger venues should be part of your spectrum clearing activities, in part because of the higher density of users, so more potential for problems, and in part because traditionally there are more potential interferers in things like stadiums than in residential neighborhoods. Of course, when it comes to what I'm calling foot based spectrum clearing, the need for lightweight portable devices with long battery life is fairly obvious. Now, equipment or instrument-wise, there are a wide variety of tools that can be used in spectrum clearing. As mentioned before, traditional coverage measurement, what people like me still call drive test, uh, tools are often leveraged for use in spectrum clearing, as are traditional interference hunting tools, like portable spectrum analyzers and monitoring receivers. And again, we'll go into more detail about these in the next few slides. There are some other, for want of a better word, um, accessories that are useful in spectrum clearing. Again, something we'll cover in a little more detail in a few more slides. Now, fortunately, the instruments and tools that are used in spectrum clearing are not specific to spectrum clearing itself. There's absolutely no need at all to go out and buy a spectrum clearing tool if you already have access to traditional coverage measurement or interference hunting tools. It is, however, necessary to understand these tools, their strengths and weaknesses, when it comes to using them for spectrum clearing and also to understand the particular measurements or modes of operation that are most useful when we are performing spectrum clearing. I'm gonna start this slide with a disclaimer. Um, like many of you, I've been working in mobile network test for a long time, and I still occasionally refer to drive test tools instead of coverage measurements tools. Um, so please forgive me if I slip up and do that here as well. Um, what I'm going to try to call coverage measurement tools are usually dedicated pieces of hardware, drive test <clears throat> scanners, that are used for cellular coverage measurements. Most of you are probably familiar with these tools. You have a scanner, you connect it to some antennas, you connect it to your laptop, you drive around and collect data from the base stations, which base stations can be seen at what areas, with which signal strengths, what neighbors, etc. In order to make all this information useful, um, it has to be coupled with position information normally provided by GPS, and we can form a visual representation of our network as well. So where the base stations are, what they cover, etc. So the question is, of course, how is this useful for spectrum clearing when there are no services? Well, fortunately for us, many of these coverage measurement systems can also measure what I'm going to call raw RF or do an RF power scan. That is, they can record the received power level over a given frequency range as you drive around. 
and then they can display that information either as a, a colored track or trace and or as a spectrum analyzer type display. And again, all of this with integrated position information. Since they're designed for driving, no special adaptation is really needed for use in a vehicle. Uh, one small point here is there are also UE phone-based coverage tools. These usually do not have this raw RF recording or monitoring capability. So when I'm talking here about coverage measurement tools for spectrum clearing, what we usually mean here is dedicated hardware scanners, not UEs. And this in turn limits the use of these coverage measurement tools in some ways that um, we'll see in a few more slides. If you've attended any of our previous webinars on interference hunting or mobile network testing, I'm sure you're aware of the various strengths and weaknesses of traditional swept spectrum analyzers versus FFT-based monitoring receivers. But just in case, I'm going to give everyone a quick review. Although both instruments provide similar information, power versus frequency, for example, they are different in terms of architecture and functionality. The spectrum analyzers tend to be more general purpose tools with a wide range of functions whereas monitoring receivers are designed for, well, well, monitoring, right, and not much else. The advantage of using a monitoring receiver, though, is that they're much faster and have a much higher probability of intercept or detection compared to, to a traditional spectrum analyzer. Uh, this is a very important when we're feature to have when you're planning a drive or a route or when we're hunting for undesired signals in cleared spectrum. That said, both classes of instruments uh, have numerous functions that are necessary or useful in spectrum clearing, such as mapping or geotagging, uh, triggering, spectrum recording, etc. We're going to cover all of these in more detail shortly. Um, there's a saying among amateur radio operators, uh, I'm an amateur radio operator, that it's better to spend money on your antenna than to spend money on your, your uh, receiver. I'm not sure that always applies to professional RF as well, but there's certainly no denying that it's important to have and to use the right antenna. And this is particularly important when it comes to spectrum clearing. A properly matched or properly tuned antenna is necessary to obtain accurate level measurements. Uh, sometimes it's necessary to see the signal at all. A special challenge comes when we're doing spectrum clearing, particularly when we're moving from a non-cellular service, like over-the-air television, to a cellular service. Why? Well, in this particular case, it's not always easy to find a practical antenna for spectrum clearing. Let's think about 700 megahertz for a moment. How many vehicle-mounted antennas, Omnis, or Yagis, or directional antennas, were available when this band was first reallocated to LTE? How long did it take before they were, let's call it a stocking item? Now, obviously, there were lots and lots and lots of antennas designed for picking up signals at 700 megahertz, right? Most people had one in their home for watching television. But nobody wanted to be running around holding a pair of rabbit ears or mounting a huge Yagi in a rotor to the roof of their car. So it's important that we keep in mind that when we're switching from one class of service, say TV, to another class of service, cellular, antennas may be more problematic than you'd expect. Also, before we decide that an antenna is close enough uh, in frequency, it's usually a good idea to sweep the antenna using a network or antenna analyzer to be sure your antenna isn't deaf to signals in the band that you're trying to clear. Sweeping the antenna also provides gain measurements at different frequencies, and uh, this, is, this can help you make better path loss calculations as well. It's worth remembering that you will most likely need both omnidirectional as well as handheld or directional antennas for spectrum clearing the first being used for detecting signals, usually in the vehicle-based phase, and the second for determining the precise location of a signal and getting rid of it. Automatic direction finding systems can also add substantial value in many cases. Now, has anyone here ever gone out in the field and then realized that they left that one critical cable or connector or filter or doohickey dad back in the office? Uh, if you do any kind of field work on a regular basis, you probably have a box full of accessories that you bring with you. And spectrum clearing is no different. Uh, there are a number of different accessories that can be used, and many of these are actually the same accessories that are used in traditional interference hunting. Uh, here I'll point out that this is one big difference between interference hunting and spectrum clearing. The accessories are backwards. What do I mean by that? Well, in interference hunting, we often need to use filters and attenuators because we need to reduce the chance of overload from strong signal sources like base stations. Whereas in spectrum clearing, filters and attenuators should not be necessary because ideally 
there shouldn't be any signals at all in the spectrum you're clearing, much less strong ones in your same band. Conversely, many people, uh, myself included, may not normally use preamplifiers or LNAs, low noise amplifiers, in interference hunting for precisely the same reason. We, we don't want to have the risk of overload. On the other hand, preamps or LNAs can be very useful in spectrum clearing since they extend the path loss range and allow us to detect undesired signals at greater distances, all without having to worry about overload or spurious signals caused by nearby sources. Now, again, this is certainly not to say that filters are never useful and preamps are always useful in spectrum clearing, but it is good to note that the use of these RF accessories in spectrum clearing is, in a sense, backwards from the way that they're used or not used in traditional interference hunting. Now that we have our instruments, our antennas, and our accessories lined up, and we have defined a certain threshold for a cleared spectrum, how do we actually go about determining if, where, and by whom this threshold is being violated? Well, there are many different ways of doing this, but there are several that are more commonly used than others. Uh, these are max hold in no particular order, max hold triggering power scan measurements, geotagging, and spectrum recording. We'll spend the next few slides going over what these are and how they can be used in spectrum clearing. Note that I'm calling these detection methods because we're basically trying to answer the question, is something out there? And all these met methods are designed to answer that question. Uh, some of them also provide additional or helpful information. And in many cases, these methodologies can, of course, be used together. Once we've determined that something is out there, we typically want more information about it. Is it a microphone? Is it a cable leak? Where is it? And at this point, we see the convergence of spectrum clearing and interference hunting. The same tools and methodologies used to find interferes in occupied spectrum can be used to find potential interferes in spectrum to be cleared. In fact, finding these sources in sort of clear spectrum, as mentioned before, is actually significantly easier than finding them in occupied spectrum. As a training opportunity, spectrum clearing is a great way to get started, by the way, in interference hunting. For many of us, max hold is an old friend that we know well and trust. Essentially, our inf instrument provides us a trace, a line, that shows the maximum level reached at a given frequency. In this screenshot, the red line is the max hold. Max hold is excellent in letting us know when a certain maximum level or threshold has been crossed. We don't have to look at the screen the whole time. If a signal was present, max hold captures it. And it works on both narrow band and wide band signals. Not only can we detect proper signals, but we can also see if the noise floor has been bumping up and down. It's easy to configure, it's easy to use, it's reliable. You know, what's not to like about max hold? Max hold does, however, have one major disadvantage in spectrum clearing. It only tells you that something happened uh, at some time in the past, at least once. We don't know when it happened. We know it happened since the last time we looked at max hold, but beyond that. Um, we don't know how long it lasted. We don't know how often it happened. And we don't even know if it may be overlapped with some other signal or not. Uh, for example, in this screenshot, we see that there was a big spike right in the middle, but there's no way to know if it happened once or 10 times, when it happened, etc. So if we do get a hit on our max hold, we almost always have to go back and do some significant further investigation. Max hold is better than nothing, sometimes though not by much. One other practical gotcha when it comes to max hold you frequently have to reset it every so often because a single big bump in the noise floor, like if you open the car doors on some cars, uh, can cause your max hold to become a single red horizontal line across the top of your display, and that essentially erases all of your data up to that point. Another way of detecting signals during spectrum clearing is triggering. The instrument or system is configured to perform some action when the received level crosses a predefined threshold. Uh, for example, we could say if the noise floor goes above neg 95 dBm, then the instrument should do something like provide an audible alert, like a beep, and or perform some action like taking a screenshot or starting a recording. And if we're very clever, we could configure some kind of trigger that also captures things like date, time, position, etc. So that when our drive is over, we have a useful record of each and every time our clear threshold is exceeded. Triggering is very powerful because it can reliably capture intermittent events, which max hold also can do, without an operator intervention, but it can also separate multiple events instead of combining them together the way that max hold would. Uh, furthermore, we can even configure our tools to run in this triggered mode continuously, 
So even if we're not actively doing spectrum clearing, we can get data whenever our instrument gets a hit in the spectrum of interest. Now the challenge in triggering is of course defining the trigger level. We want to be sure we don't miss anything, but at the same time we don't want a constant string of false alarms that will take more time to sort through than doing the measurements by hand. Just as in max hold, a certain amount of caution is needed to avoid false alarms caused by brief impulse noise sources, especially things like car door locks, windshield wiper motors, etc. In the section on coverage measurement tools, we talked about how many of these instruments and systems can display raw RF, and hopefully the screenshot will give you a better idea of what I mean here. Essentially, the information that we get is very similar to that provided by a normal spectrum analyzer or monitoring receiver, with power versus frequency on top and a waterfall or spectrogram diagram on the bottom. This information is recorded along with geographical information, so it allows the spectrum to be studied or played back to examine or investigate signals found in the spectrum to be cleared. Uh, these types of power scan measurements can and often are coupled together with some form of max hold or triggering, and this increases the efficiency in determining locations where signals might be present in the spectrum that we're clearing. Let's talk about geotagging. Many handheld instruments, and again, these could be either spectrum analyzers or monitoring receivers, now have the ability to record and store position information by means of an attached GPS. And this is extremely helpful when it comes to spectrum clearing. Unlike cover, coverage measurement systems, which are usually either connected to a laptop or require post-processing, instruments with a geotagging type function can store and display levels on a map that's internal to the instrument, no additional accessories or equipment required. Uh, this is very helpful in that these same handhelds that we're using to detect spectrum anomalies can also then be used to track down the source once it's been detected. Uh, traditional coverage measurement tools are not very appropriate typically for interference hunting. Spectrum clearing measurements on portable instruments can be taken a variety of ways. Uh, the first and most obvious one is simply to record whenever a level is exceeded. Another way we can make measurements is to record every time we travel a certain distance. Again, this is where our path loss measurement comes in very handy. Or we could just take measurements every so often in time, every 10 seconds, or some combination of these parameters. Note too that although we're talking about portable instruments, these instruments are often used in vehicles as well. Um, some geotagging applications will also allow indoor measurements by using manual position entry if you don't have GPS. Again, the advantage of using this type of instrument is that it allows both detection of signals as well as the ability to locate these signals all again in a single instrument. And although having the maps directly on the instrument is a very handy way to do spectrum clearing in the field, there are many cases in which we want to do post-processing. Um, I talked about this before and I said, for example, do we want to find the most clear areas or do we want to put, uh, do our most of our searching around the areas that are most interesting to us? Uh, the good news is that we can really do this either way. Uh, here we see an example of where we export spectrum into another application here, Google Earth. And this allows us to see that there's a significant bump in the received level near a particular intersection on the top right. Uh, in any case, the number of sites to choose from, um, we can choose from these sites the ones that are either as far away from this bump as possible, say site two here, or we could use this information to focus our efforts on that particular intersection to locate the signals that are still present in our supposedly clear spectrum. I'd like to talk about spectrum recording as well for a moment, and in particular, I'd like to point out how this is different from geotagging. In geotagging, we normally are interested in making a measurement of a certain parameter, like level, in various locations. Uh, this is easy to do, but we lose certain information. We know what the level was, but no idea what the signal looked like. Some portable or handheld instruments can also record and play back spectrum, providing a much higher level of information that can be used to track down and identify the source. We can see what the offending signal looks like. And again, combining this information with time, date, or GPS location makes it a very powerful tool in tracking down the source of signals in our cleared spectrum. Uh, recordings can be continuous or they can also be triggered to take place only if a certain signal level is exceeded. So once we detect something above our clear threshold in spectrum, what do we do? Call the FCC? Well, you can try that. Uh, but normally self-help is more efficient and more effective. If you've ever done interference hunting again in occupied spectrum, then you know that locating RF sources in spectrum clearing is, is going to be a real joy. It's much, much easier to find a signal when it's the only signal that's present. Um, we also can use our 
things such as RF power scan or triggering, geotagging to have a starting point for our investigation. And again, ultimately the tools and techniques that we'll use at this point are the same that we use in normal interference hunting. Um, and then, as I mentioned a few slides back, we typically don't need filters, but we might be able to take advantage of things like LNAs. So things keep getting better because the spectrum is so clean. And lastly, again, automated direction finding systems are sometimes also advantageous during spectrum clearing. When we're looking for very high power sources that can be seen from a substantial distance, or where we're looking for intermittent sources. So before we wrap up and go into the question and answer period, let's talk about some of the lessons that we learned from spectrum clearing at 700 megahertz. First, let's start with the good news. The migration of television broadcasters went relatively smoothly. Uh, in all honesty, straggling broadcasters would not have been much of a problem since A, it's easy to recognize a broadcast signal, and B, you can look them up in the FCC database and just give them a call. But it took a little while to find all those 700 megahertz wireless microphones out there. And again, I suppose the users of these microphones could be forgiven for not being regular visitors to the FCC website. Um, there really wasn't an easy way to get information out to everyone who owned one of these microphones. On the other hand, the microphones themselves weren't too difficult to find, mostly because they were also analog modulated. You could do a simple FMD mod of the signal, and that provided enough information often to locate the owner. Cable egress, on the other hand, was a bit of a surprise when it came to spectrum clearing at 700 megahertz. Cable systems have been leaking signals at those frequencies for years, but as I mentioned before at the beginning, they weren't really much of an issue for UHF TV broadcasters. There is, however, an important and useful lesson here. Had the new spectrum owners, the wireless network operators, um, looked at 700 megahertz more carefully before the reallocation took place, they might have had an easier time identifying and dealing with cable egress long before LTE was turned on or even before the old services were turned off. And lastly, I think many people underestimated the propagation and penetration characteristics of 700 megahertz compared to many other cellular bands, for example, 1900. As a general rule, spurious signals and other emissions become less common as you move up in frequency. And quite a few people, myself included, uh, were surprised by how many problems were caused by things like fluorescent lights, photocopiers, etc., simply because these spurs, these lower frequency spurs, could propagate from indoors to outdoors much more easily than higher frequency signals. So in conclusion, I hope that everyone has an idea of why spectrum clearing is an important and integral part of the whole spectrum reallocation process. As we know and have learned from experience, the primary responsibility for cleaning your new spectrum rests with the new licensee, at least in the United States. It's very dangerous to assume that being granted a license by the FCC means that your spectrum is ready to go. And looking for undesired signals is, of course, a lot easier when the spectrum is still unoccupied. Spectrum clearing is not something we really should try to approach willy-nilly by driving around town a few times with a spec and a max hold. Uh, careful planning and especially an understanding of propagation and path loss can be used to create a spectrum clearing plan that's both effective and efficient. And lastly, we've tried to give a general overview of the different methodologies and tools that can be used for spectrum clearing based on our experiences doing spectrum clearing at 700 megahertz and other frequency bands. Again, most of the tools used for coverage measurement and interference hunting can be used for spectrum clearing. The mode of operation and the methods by which we use these tools are in some cases substantially different when we're doing spectrum clearing versus interference hunting. And with that, I believe we've come to the question and answers section of our presentation. Uh, Kyle? Yeah, thanks, Paul. This is Kyle again. Um, great presentation. Um, really great presentation. We've had a lot of feedback commenting on how great of a presentation it is. Um, we have a few questions. If anyone has any questions, uh, please submit them to the control panel, and we'll get to them as fast as we can. All right. So, Paul, the first question we had come in. Could you explain again the difference between spectrum clearing and interference hunting? Sure. Um, Spectrum clearing and interference hunting are, are really, in a way, somewhat the same things. We're looking for signals that shouldn't be there, right? I mean, that's essentially what interference hunting is in spectrum clearing. The difference is really in the way that you approach it. In interference hunting, we typically have an idea of what's being interfered with, and we know that signals are a problem, well, because they're interfering with something. So I'll give an example of a cellular base station, right? We typically know which sectors are being affected. A sector has high RSSI. And so we know that we need to look in the sector for something creating a, a interference. And we have an idea of how strong it must be 
Uh, depending on the base station, we may have access to be able to look at the signal through the antennas and have an idea of what it looks like in spectrum. So in interference hunting, we're being very pro, I'm sorry, we're being very reactive. We know that something is a problem. We know roughly where it is, and we know roughly what its power and roughly what it looks like. In spectrum clearing, there really is nothing there yet. So what are we looking for? If I pass by a signal, is this signal a problem or not? Well, it kind of depends on how loud it is and how far away it potentially could be from other services. And we don't really know what might be out there. There's no way we can look through the base station antennas and see what it is. And as I mentioned before, a good example of this is the, the backwardsness, if you will, of the tools. Uh, filters are very important in, in uh, interference hunting in many cases, not used in spectrum clearing. Preamplifiers, limited usefulness in occupied spectrum could be very useful in spectrum clearing. So I'd say the big difference is that in interference hunting, we're reacting to something. We know something is out there. We know it's a problem. Uh, we know where it is. In spectrum clearing, we're looking for things that might be out there that might be a problem. Um, and we're really not sure if this is going to be an issue unless we do something like path loss calculations or know where our positions of services base stations are going to be. Okay, great answer. Um, so the next question we had in, um, we'll try and get it across as best I can. So um, asking about, for example, band 17, if that's already on, if one wants to do some spectrum clearing in band 12 on 700 megahertz, um, how could they do that if uh, another operator is using band 17? Well, it does become more complicated, right? I mean, I, I mentioned, I just finished saying how much nicer it is to do things in spectrum that's already clear. Um, this is a problem. One of the things that you'll run into is, of course, the bands sometimes, well, I hate to say overlap, but the bands are sometimes very close to each other. And so this can be a problem if there are nearby signals, because again, now you're suffering from the problem of trying to find signals when other signals are around. I don't think it's a particular challenge in doing that. I, I think what at some point in the spectrum reallocation or spectrum clearing process, the other service in your band, whatever range of frequencies that is, X to Y megahertz, is going to have to go off the air right, in order for you to use it. And at that case, you should, it may be a small window, but you should have a window that you can actually go on drive and look in. So I, I don't really see that being a problem. Um, obviously, a little more care has to be taken when you're looking around other signals that are on the air. That's okay. right. Um, the next question uh, we had come in is, uh, many modern spectrum analyzers are FFT-based. Is that the same as an FFT-based receiver? If not, what is the difference? <laughs> okay, probably probably not specific to spectrum clearing, but I'll answer that question because actually I get that question a lot. Uh, in a traditional swept spectrum analyzer, it's, it's heterodyne based, right? It has a local oscillator, it mixes with the incoming signal, and it sweeps across the frequency range. It has a certain resolution bandwidth, certain width, and it, it moves that essentially. This is an oversimplification, but it moves that across a certain frequency range and looks at each at each point, so to speak. Uh, an FFT based receiver grabs a, a much wider chunk of spectrum, much wider than the, the resolution bandwidth of a spectrum analyzer does an analog to digital and then using various forms of processing spits it out. So it's much faster. It can cover spectrum much much more quickly than a swept analyzer. Um, that's the, the traditional separation of the two. What you're seeing in some cases is that you'll have a swept spectrum analyzer that sweeps, but it within its resolution bandwidth it does an FFT. And so what you'll see is some people saying it's a swept FFT based analyzer, which is I suppose not completely incorrect, uh, but there's a difference. Any time that you have an analyzer that, that is using any kind of heterodyning or sweeping, anything that has a sweep time set to it, um, then you're going to have a performance hit compared to a purely FFT-based analyzer. So yes, you are seeing hybrids between them. Um, a pure FFT analyzer does not sweep. If your instrument has a resolution band within a sweep time, then at least at some level it's doing sweeping. Now, is this distinction important for spectrum clearing? Uh, like everything else, it depends. Obviously, the more FFT you have, or it's pure FFT, the faster it'll be, and the more likely it is you'll see these signals that you're out hunting for in the middle of nowhere. Um, on the other hand, these are purpose-built instruments. They tend to be more expensive because they're higher performance, uh, but they are extremely good at what they do. So I hope that answers the question. Um, if, if someone has questions, please contact me. I can give you more technical details. But you are starting to see it. And, and I'll, I'll end with one little observation. I think that the fact that you're seeing so many swept analyzers now incorporating at some level FFT uh, goes to point out how FFT really is in many ways superior to swept analyzers for many operations, right? You don't see FFT-based analyzers adding sweeping, right? You see swept analyzers adding FFT. So obviously there is some advantage to using FFT, and that's doubly true when it comes to spectrum clearing. Okay, great. 
Uh, next question we had in, um, we'll have time for just a few more questions here. So the next question, does the spectrum actually get cleared away physically? Um, how, do, how does one actually remove a signal? <laughs> you turn it off. Um, the, so what we say physically, we're, we're basically we're defining clear as there's no signal at frequency X above level Y, right? I mean, I want to say that in this band, you know, from say, seven, whatever, 770 to 780, just arbitrarily picking a number, right? Um, I, I don't want there to be any signals above neg 100, okay? Now, why would there be power at those frequencies? Well, because something is generating power. Um, again, it could be a cable signal that's leaking out. It could be a wireless microphone. It could be um, a neon sign in someone's business, et cetera. So the only way to make them stop generating power is to find them and turn them off. And this is where spectrum clearing starts becoming more like interference hunting. Spectrum clearing or driving around looking really for those signals. Once we find them, unless it's obvious what they are, we are usually going to have to hunt them down. But ultimately, the only way to clear the spectrum from a physical point of view, remove the power at those frequencies, is to turn off the things that are generating that power, or at least keep them from, from uh, propagating it. For example, cable, they still generate the power, but it stays inside of the cable. Uh, a good point here, too, again, I, I think I mentioned this in the webinar, is the higher you go in frequency, there are fewer things there are that can generate signals at those frequencies. There are lots of things that generate signals at 100 megahertz that have nothing to do with radios, okay? Power line noise, for example. Once you start getting up to one gigs, two gigs, five gigs, 10 gigs, the number of physical objects, things, man-made or otherwise, that can generate signals at those frequencies becomes much, much lower. So generally speaking, when we're doing spectrum clearing, the problems we're gonna have are on the lower frequency end of the scale because A, there are more things that generate signals there, and B, because those signals will propagate farther. So again, the, to go back to the original question, the only way to clear spectrum is to find the things that are, are generating power at those frequencies and, and turn them off. Okay, great. Um, next question we had come in. Uh, what are some of the, the major issues that exist in crowded urban areas for spectrum clearing? Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't know if we have enough time for that question. I'll try. Um, in crowded urban areas, well, first of all, the more people you have, the more electronics or, or man-made sources of RF you have. I mean, you have devices, you have harmonics, you have intermodal, you have spurs. I mean, any place you have more people, you're going to have more signals. And, more, and any place you have more people, you're going to have more people who could be interfered with. Uh, I, I mentioned the stadium example earlier. It's the same kind of thing. In, in a stadium, for example, you have lots more things that can generate interfering signals, right? But you also have lots more people that could be interfered with, right? You may have a stadium that's got 40,000 people in it. That's a, if you have interferers there, that's a much bigger problem than if you have interferers in, say, rural South Carolina. Um, so in a sense, urban areas suffer from that problem. That, that's undeniable. The other problem in spectrum clearing in urban areas is the, the path loss issue. Right. If I'm driving through the urban canyons, as I would in say Manhattan, Miami, you know, someplace like that, uh, when you get between big buildings, it's very hard for you to see signals that are maybe on the other side of the building or on top of the building. Uh, this again is where having a high performance instrument can help. An FFT based analyzer here would be usually better than a swept spectrum. There's some cases in which you're simply not going to see them very easily from the ground. And Again, this is the challenge that you get in urban areas, and it's the same challenges that we face with interference hunting. Um, the biggest problem is, again, the density of users, both sources and sinks or, or interferees of, of interference, and also the difficulty in seeing potential interference sources or, or things still in cleared spectrum from anything other than a very short distance away. All right, thank you. That's about all the time we have today. I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, Spectrum Clearing, Preparing for Future Services, presented by Rody and Schwartz. Again, our presenter today was Paul Denisowski, Applications Engineer at Rody and Schwartz. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Kyle, and thanks, everybody, for attending.